Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I thought I would uh, start by introducing uh, essentially the guest. That's Adam, Professor Adam Mossoff. Uh, and then <clears throat> the home team is represented by <laughs> Professor Lemley wearing the uh, home uniform. Uh, so Adam is a professor of law at George Mason University. He's done a lot of uh, very top quality work on the intersection of uh, property rights, property theory, and intellectual property, all really a wide ranging work in that field. So Adam uh, has his uh, undergrad degree from Michigan where he majored in philosophy and did graduate work in uh, political philosophy at Columbia and got his law degree uh, from Chicago. Um, so not surprisingly, he's going to take the pro-property rights <laughs> position. And then he clerked on the Fifth Circuit before uh, coming into law teaching. Um, Mark, as you probably know, is the William Newcomb Professor of Law here at Stanford Law School. Um, he's a Stanford undergrad and went to law school at uh, what we used to call Bolt Hall across the bay there. Uh, he's also the director of the Stanford LLM program in law science and technology, and I think some of the LLM students are here. Um, Mark is, uh, has a wide-ranging uh, uh, scholarly resume, but also has the distinction of being a founding partner at a major IP firm here in the Bay Area, Dury Tangri, where he is still a partner and actively litigating lots of fascinating cases. Um, the format here is going to be as follows. So I'm going to um, give each of these speakers five minutes of, of sort of free run to give their basic points. Um, first Adam will go, and then Mark. And uh, then I'm going to follow up with some follow-up questions. So I'll do a little back and forth sort of at a moderator level and um, try to elicit a little bit of the details of the positions and push back a little bit on a few points. Then I'll give each of them some rebuttal time to respond to the presentation and, and colloquy with me. So they'll each have sort of a final word uh, to, to kind of defend their views. And then we'll open it up to questions and answers from the audience, and that's you. I did not clarify how we want to handle the queue, Kevin, if I can find you. Uh, could you run the queue and keep order in that process? Just have people line up at the mic if you want the broadcast. Uh, right, so that <laughs> yeah. the mic will represent. Okay. That's a, that will work for our queuing process, right? Because it's being recorded, right? Okay, good. All right, so um, that'll work. So without further ado, I will start the five minutes for Professor Mossoff for right now. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, having me out. Um, happy to be here to uh, uh, to, uh, to fight on uh, on Mark's home uh, home field advantage. Um, but I, but I realized he still needed a handicap, so before I left home, I, I smothered myself all over my, my six-year-old daughter out of cold to effectively pick up her cold to give him the appropriate uh, handicap that he'll need to, to have this battle with me. So um, um, I'm just going to quickly frame some of the, uh, uh, the, the framework that I'm going to deploy through our discussion today um, and uh, get into more specifics as we, as we have our back and forth discussion. So I'm going to start at kind of the broader theoretical abstract level, which will then show you the application as we get into the specifics. Um, so first I need to clear kind of the field and, and, and clear the air a little bit. Um, there's a lot of confusion in intellectual property about what is property. Um, a lot of people assume that pro when you talk about property, you mean land. And they conflate property rights with land. Um, I actually have just written an essay called The Trespass Fallacy in Patent Law, where I talk about the problems with this conflation between property and land that is deployed by patent scholars and intellectual property scholars more broadly. Property is not the same thing as land. Um, in fact, all of you learned that in your first year property course. Property is about the securing of the exclusive use of an asset uh, from interference from third parties. And this exclusive use covers all sorts of different types of subject matter, whether we're talking about water, spectrum, air, chattels, like boxes, in your first run of your very first cases you read in, in, uh, in your first year property course, future interests, um, which relate to land but are separate and distinct from land, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the importance of recognizing this is that you shouldn't conflate the issues of land with how property rights exclusive use is secured in a particular asset. Now, when you talk about property, securing an exclusive use in something. There's two important frameworks that you get from that. One is conceptual and one is normative. Now, at the conceptual level, 
what this, what the, the very important point to recognize when you talk about intellectual property being property is that this situates intellectual properties such as patents within, conceptually and descriptively, within property doctrines and a broader doctrinal framework that secures those doctrines with a, with, within civil procedure, constitutional law, and other related uh, doctrines. And in fact, this is exactly what happened in history. And in fact, that's how I started my work in patent law, is doing intellectual history of patent law, and discovered that American courts, beginning in the very early years of the patent system, incorporated conceptually into patents doctrines that had long been deployed <coughs> in property law, whether in land or chattels or water, and did this explicitly. So they, inter for instance, they adopted the interpretive canons governing how deeds are construed into patents, and said patents, therefore, will be construed liberally in favor of patent owners for the reason it's citing to cases involving construction of deeds where deeds were favored, uh, construed in favor of title owners. They explicitly incorporated into patent law the conveyance rights doctrines that you have from, from property doctrines. So the, your ability to convey a lesser interest, you know, uh, so a fee simple owner can convey a, a limited estate, whether it's a life estate or, or a fee simple defeasible or some type of, or, or, or impose restrictive covenants that run with the, uh, the, the property interest. Um, in the 19th century, they explicitly recognized that uh, patent owners who were engaging in the same type of restrictive co covenants, imposing geographic restrictions, use restrictions, sale restrictions, and other types of restraints, were, could do so for the same reasons that all property owners can convey restrictive rights in their property <coughs> interest. You can convey an easement in a, in a water right or, or, or in a chattel, and you can convey the same type of restrictive right in your um, in your, in your patent or other type of intellectual property right. Lastly, constitutional protection. So recognizing that property uh, patents were property rights were very important for the 19th century courts because they, as a doctrinal matter, then recognized that under the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment, under the Takings Clause of the Fifth Amendment, uh, patents acquired constitutional protections that were not accorded to franchise grants or regulatory entitlements that were created like, bri like franchises and bridges. Um, so for those who know the Charles River Bridge case, where the bridge franchise grant was, de was denied constitutional protections under both the uh, Fifth Amendment takings clause and the due process clause, the exact opposite occurred with patents. Courts happily and very gleefully extended to cal uh, patents <coughs> due process protections and substantive protections like takings protections under against unauthorized uses by the government. And lastly, consistent with the conveyance doctrines that they were incorporating from, incorporating from um, uh, pr real property and other property doctrines was, was, was a presumption of what, of what economists call private ordering, right? And this is reflected in the adoption of the conveyance interest that property, since property secures exclusive use in an asset, then what that means is that people can determine through their own private ordering how that use will be deployed either in the market or used for their own interest. And that the prop and the property rights in inventions and and in copyrighted works and other types of a assets that are secured as intellectual property are secured in the same way for the same reasons that similar interests were secured to property owners in other contexts. So the last, last point to recognize is the normative point, which is that what's built into all of these doctrines is the normative presumption that new values in useful arts, expressed in useful <coughs> arts, that should be rightfully secured to their creators. And so this normative interest was built into all of these doctrines from property law, and it was extended and therefore was what justified the creation and extension of these property interests in patent owners and other activities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adam. So Mark, you're up. So I, I want to start with a point of agreement with Adam, right, which is property is not just land. Uh, property uh, encompasses uh, a variety of different things. Uh, and um, uh, we often sort of wonder why we lump certain things into the uh, first year property class that don't seem to have much to do with each other. But I think you've got to resist the temptation to call any legal uh, power that you have a property right. Uh, in England before the revolution, uh, the East India Trading Company had the exclusive right by governmental fiat uh, to trade uh, with the East Indies. Nobody else could do it. It was, un it was unlawful uh, to engage in trade with the East Indies unless you had this government permit. You can think of that as a property right. right? You could say the East India Trading Company had a property right in trade with the East Indies. But I don't think it makes sense to call it a property right. What it is is a mother may I regime. It is a regime under which if you want to do something, you must first get the permission of a governmental actor. 
Right? And so one thing we might distinguish is between uh, 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 land or other things that we give into the uh, general control of private actors and things that require uh, governmental permission. Now, that's a distinction that uh, legal scholars have told us doesn't always hold up, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. But one question, one thing to focus on, right, is why do we want to call it a property right? Adam says, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a property right, and therefore various things flow from that. I think the problem is precisely that if we call something a property right, we start to think subjectively about the things we understand to be property, about land and about chattel, uh, and we start to assume that the basic legal rules are similar, uh, when in fact, uh, as I will suggest, they shouldn't be similar at all. Uh, that the fundamental nature of this thing, if you wish to call it a property right, the patent, um, is so different from the fundamental nature of other things that we call property that calling it property, thinking of it as property, is going to mislead us. Right? So consider, uh, if this were a property right, that the government is constantly creating new rights. Created 250,000 new rights last year. Um, and it's creating new rights, not just that sort of apply going forward. This isn't like new land we've found. It's creating new rights that apply retroactively uh, and that apply retroactively to independent inventors. Uh, something over 90% of all patent lawsuits filed in the country today are not filed against people who took your patent uh, uh, knowingly. They're filed against inventors, against people who came up with their own technology independently. But because a government, four years later, said, we want to grant the exclusive power to practice that technology to one party rather than another, are violating the law. Um, now, you can call that a property regime, but that sounds to me like a mother may I regulation regime. We take a group of 9,000 government bureaucrats, we invest with them the power uh, to decide who gets to make particular types of products and sell those products, and we do it not on the basis of some moral entitlement, you stole this from me, or a free writing impulse, we do it because the government says, uh, as far as we can tell in our limited inquiry, you were the first to do this thing. Um, and I think for that reason, because it gets at independent development, remedies in patent law are much more publicly inflected than they are in real property. If I win a trespass case over land, I might prevent you from coming on my land, or I might determine the boundary dispute. Where does the boundary lie between two private parties? Uh, if I say no one can sell a smartphone in this country without the permission of Apple, uh, I do something that's rather more significant, particularly when I apply that rule not to people who took their idea for the cell phone from Apple, but to people who developed it independently. And that leads me to a, a, a final point, which is um, that IP doesn't look like property. Patents, in particular, don't look like property in one important respect. Uh, Jim Besson and Mike Moyer uh, have an adage in their book, if you can't tell where the boundaries are, it ain't property. Uh, and in patent law, we can't tell where the boundaries are. We always, always fight in patent litigation over the meaning of the patent claim, over what it covers. I've been litigating for over 20 years. I have never read a case, I've never seen a case where there wasn't a dispute over the meaning of the boundaries. Now, maybe Adam will tell you, oh, that's a small subset of cases, right? Most of the time, right, we don't have fights at all. You're just seeing the ones that go to court. I tried to run some rough numbers on this. Near as I can tell, and the numbers are hard to get, we have about 600 million real property boundaries in the United States. Uh, borders between one piece of private property and another. Uh, I don't know, I'm not going to vouch for that number, but I'll vouch for it at an order of magnitude. Um, we appear to have about, um, at, at estimating high, 16,000 disputes a year over property borders that are filed in court. You get about 160 that actually make it to a judgment. Uh, if you mapped those numbers to patent law, what we would expect to see is about 50 patent lawsuits a year uh, among the 500,000 patents issued uh, every year and about half a decision a year, maybe one decision every two years that actually made it to a district court. What we see are uh, uh, two to three orders of magnitude more disagreement uh, in, uh, over the scope of boundaries, over the scope of this, quote, property right in patent law uh, than we do in uh, real property. 
Similarly, if you try to look at licenses and transactions, here the numbers are even harder. Right? Think how many times in the course of your year you cross a private property boundary. You walk onto somebody's land. You arrive at Stanford, you go to the mall, you go to a friend's house, you cut a corner while walking down the street and step on their property. Uh, uh, you know, my guess is, a conservative estimate is, you can see 150 billion boundary crossings a year. Uh, perhaps one in 10 million of those are litigated. Right? By contrast, something like 5 to 25% to of all uh, uh, efforts to use patent result in litigation. Well, what does this tell me? Rob is telling me I should tell you that quickly. I don't think this means we can't use the ideas of property where they are appropriate in thinking about IP. Right? Ownership rights, as, as Adam points out, transfer, those may be useful things. Um, but that doesn't make IP property any more than the fact that we use contract law to determine the, uh, the basis of that transaction makes IP contract law. It makes it a thing for which it is sometimes useful to turn to legal doctrines that we have already well established. But it's something we ought to think about uh, not as land or anything like land, uh, but as a thing of its own right. And if you disagree with that, ask yourself whether in Texas it ought to be lawful to shoot a patent infringer. It's lawful to shoot somebody who trespasses on your land. It's lawful to shoot someone who tries to steal your car or your property in Texas. Um, does it make sense to say, yeah, you ought to similarly you ought to be able to shoot the guys at Samsung, right? That we've now determined that they've infringed, <laughs> infringed Apple's patent. If that sounds reasonable, then pro IP sounds like property. If it sounds vaguely ludicrous, it's because these things are, I think, fundamentally different. All right, so uh, let me turn back to Adam, hold those thoughts for a few minutes, and um, I can uh, push back on a couple of points. So um, here's, here's one, uh, I think, question that for you might be a softball, because it starts <laughs> with, with property theory. It starts with some very basic philosophical issues. So this is just a warm-up to get you comfortable and get your guard down. Um, you know, generally, uh, at least uh, in one school, prominent school of thought, we think of a property as a fundamental right that people have that precedes, in some sense, the formation of civil government. I'm talking here about ideas like the state of nature or uh, things that would be similar to Rawls's veil of ignorance. It's a conceptual sort of setup where you imagine what are the rights that people have inherently or naturally or by virtue of just being people. And then you imagine constructing a legitimate state on the basis of these pre-existing rights. Very familiar ground for you, I'm sure. Um, we would think uh, that a true property right would have to fit into the category of really being justifiable as a basic natural right that people have that precedes the state. Mm -hmm. So then why, and I think Mark will not in agreement, why is IP always mediated by state agencies? Why is the idea that, well, I have you know, a copyrightable composition, or I have a patentable idea, and it's already mine. I just need to go to some government bureau to get it ratified or, or rubber stamped. Why does that strike us as not quite right? And if that strikes us as not quite right, uh, we might have to say, we don't really have a pre-existing right in the same sense as other property rights, so maybe Mark's right. It's not really a property right. What do you think? <laughs> um, the, um, the argument proves too much. In a sense that, um, and, and this is kind of what, what I was thinking about in response to uh, Mark, some of the Mark's initial uh, comments. Um, it's important to recognize that lots of rights come into existence when you form civil society that don't exist, that don't pre-exist civil society, but nonetheless should and ought to be protected in civil society. Contract rights are not natural rights in the sense of there aren't contracts in the state of nature. Due process rights are not natural rights. Due process rights are civil rights just like contract rights are. Um, and in fact, this is exactly how they fra framed it in the time, uh, at the time of the founding. Um, and in fact, conveyance rights for land, which is a type of property right. Um, and this goes to contract rights are, are, are in a sense, um, parasitic or derivative of property rights. Contract rights are rights of transferring a thing to someone else. So you first have to have the right in the thing before you can transfer. Well, let me interject because I'm going to do this and this back and forth. Okay. So you mean that the basic possessory right to real property you would concede is sort of a uh, natural right or a pre-existing right. Well, but when you get 
to conveyance and exchange and alienability, there you see the necessity or, or at least the desirability of a mediating state entity. Is that the idea? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a little more complicated than that um, in, the, in, at, in two levels, two, at two points. First is that it's not possession, it's value creation. Um, that when they talked about possession, it, you know, as you guys learn in your first year property, just walking across a piece of land does not get you the right to that land. You have to do something with it. You have to value. You have to create value. You have to have a home, start using it in some way, shape, or form. This is the so when Locke talked about mixing labor, as I've talked about in my in my scholarship, his this was a metaphor for productive labor, uh, value creation, not value in an economic sense, but in a moral sense, creating the things necessary for human survival and human human flourishing. Um, so the, and then once you have the value creation, then you have to recognize that the various myriad ways that you secure that, those values are, um, have, you have, ultimately in civil society, you have to go to government to protect. And so civil rights are just as fundamental and morally justified and, 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 and should be secured to their creators in property interests as, uh, as all types of uh, And of that's rights. where you're going to lump IP. Yeah. And therefore... Having the state be a necessary element doesn't disprove that it's property. No, okay. for the same reason that having a state as a necessary element in enforcing your due process rights doesn't make mean okay. that due process is just a special privilege grant that okay. is a fundamental right. That's that's I get it. Uh, Mark may have some pushback on that, but I get it. Second question for you would be to pick up a thread that Mark put down on the table, which I think is always important in these conversations. It's a very consequentialist argument that says, look, you know, we can talk about theory and lock and blah, 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 but the consequences of property rhetoric are very real, the practical implications of calling something property. And that's because we have a mental apparatus that goes along with property rhetoric, which, according to Mark, brings a lot of bad results in the case of intellectual property. It brings us off track, takes us off topic, and probably makes IP into something different operationally than it is, than it really should be. Right? Um, so what do you say about that? What do you say about the idea that property rhetoric is so powerful that even if at some philosophical level you've got some points, we should back away from it simply because it produces bad results. It produces property thought. You know, we get into property think mode, and that causes us problems. Um, well, the, that is a self-creating problem of, the, of what, I, what, I, what I say is when they say property rhetoric, they're creating a straw man. Of what I've identified as the trespass fallacy, which is conflating proper, uh, all property protection with with fences and trespass doctrine, and uh, and 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 thinking impl implicitly and incorrectly, as you know from your first year property class, that property means some unlimited right, which, as you know, it's not unlimited. Property pro your uh, property rights in land, just as in water and chattels and spectrum, are defined by other people's rights, which are equal rights to their property through doctrines like nuisance doctrines like restricted covenants and easements and all sorts of uh, various ways in which property which rights are bounded by the equal rights of other people to the exclusive use of their of their assets and um, and so insofar as people complain about a, a, a prop uh, the property so-called property rhetoric leading to bad results it's a product of their own improper framing of what they mean by property and um, and in fact it, 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 this, it in fact, this entire success, historical success of the American patent system is entirely because it was treated as a property doctrine. It's because they treat it as a property right that you had the creation of these conveyance interests, which you had the, you had the extension of, the, of, of, of these rights beyond, uh, beyond the immediate technology of the 18th century, and they recognized that inventions covered all new types of inventions that came about whether it was new inventions in the 18th, 19th century and new inventions in the 20th century in biotech and in, 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 in the computer revolution. And so that those are the, the tremendous benefits that come with and, rec and properly recognizing that when, you're secu that when someone creates a new value, in, you know, when they've created a new value relative to other people and secured equally to each of these people, that should be secured to them. Okay, good. So now keep in mind if you have any sort of... Uh, you know, ace in the hole type point, hold it for the rebuttal because you'll get your shot at that. Let me turn to Mark now and follow up on a few things. So, Mark, um, I'm sure you can see this coming. We both know the statute. It's, it's in books with both of our name on it. Uh, so you know this is coming. Let me quote, patents shall have the attributes of personal property, Section 261, 35 U.S.C. Uh, what about this one? You have a right to a patent unless the examiner can show that it lacks novelty or that it is obvious, right? 
implying that the default is you, the inventor, the private citizen, already inchoately possess this right, and it's the burden on this administrative office to prove that you shouldn't have it, okay? You can take them in, in pieces or together, but my point is the statute seems to suggest not only that I'm talking patents here, though you can find elements of this in copyright, less in trademark, we're not going to go there too much, that, that the statute says plainly, simply, I mean, very, you know, uh, Scalia plain text, patents are property, kaboom, end of discussion. And that you have, when you come to the office with an invention, the presumption is that you are on your way towards perfecting your right. So it's not only a property right, but it's a property right that you innately, inchoately, already almost possess, unless we can take it away from you. So. Right. So, well, first off, let me just be a little bit picky in the actual language. So Rob quoted <laughs> part of Section 261 to you. Uh, the full Section 261, if I recall correctly, is entitled ownership slash assignment. And it says, subject to the conditions of this title, that is all the limitations <laughs> of the Property Right Act, pro patents shall have the aspects of personal property. Right? Now, one way to read that is to say, never mind all the differences we talked about. Uh, uh, they must, therefore, be personal property. Not land, but personal property. The um, way I read that is we put that just in the section entitled ownership assignment for a reason. And we said, uh, subject to the rest of this title for a reason, uh, which is to say, as I indicated earlier, we do want actually to invoke some of the law of property, right? Because it's useful to do so, right? And Adam's historical points, I think, are, are quite consistent with that, right? Uh, not with a thinking that these patents are, in fact, just like land, um, but with a thinking that we've got a body of law which, in some respects, transfer ownership uh, uh, is sufficiently like property uh, that we ought to take those similarities into account. Um, but that doesn't mean, I think, that we have to sort of throw out or ignore all of the differences, particularly when the rest of the statute, I think, would have been largely unnecessary okay. in a world in which we thought it was property. And let me, let me briefly get to 102, your okay. other point. And I'll come back to this. Go ahead. Okay. Um, or if you want to. Well, just a quick one on this. So what is the best condition uh, or other provision of the Patent Act that supports your view? What's the single biggest exception to property status which, if read into Section 261, which I quoted, would hammer your point right home. See what I'm getting at? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, so I think there are a number of them, right? Um, uh, I, so we, we start with 102, right? You say uh, 102 <laughs> does, in fact, uh, say, uh, not the right, by the way, the, but shall be entitled. Shall be entitled. Uh, and an entitlement and a right are not necessarily property the same time, thing. Property time. Um, uh, <laughs> that you'll be entitled to get a patent from the PTO unless one of these other things is true. That's a burden-shifting presumption, right? That says, prove your case. Um, I think that has the same legal, and it, it is odd, I admit, that the, we put the burden of proving non-entitlement to a patent on the examiner. I think that's a mistake. It might even be a mistake that results from some of this conception of property. Um, but the fact that we do it right, doesn't mean that we change the substantive rights. It means we change the burden of proof of who has to come forward with evidence first. So the fact that um, I can't have a patent if someone did this thing before even if the rest of the world doesn't know about it, even if it's never happened in the United States, uh, I can't have a patent if someone even talked about it before, uh, even though they never actually built it or reduced it to practice. I can't have a patent uh, if uh, I am the first person ever to have done this thing before. No one has ever thought of it. But it's sufficiently similar to other things that people have thought about uh, that uh, that, uh, that, that we think it's not worth giving you a patent. And then I think kind of most fundamentally, um, I can't have a patent that lasts for longer than 20 years with certain very small specified exceptions, right? If we, if we really thought this was like other aspects of property, it would be worth asking the question, well, why doesn't, why don't the, the heirs of uh, Thomas Edison still have rights in fundamental inventions? I think there's a perfectly good answer to that. The world, a world in which we actually accumulated all of the patents and kept them still in force would get harder and harder to invent anything with. But that's a government regulation answer. OK. Right? I, I, you made some good points. But let me come back with this, right? I mean, uh, in the law of real property, which we're selectively staying away from, 
I, I don't think that anyone would argue that a 20-year lease is not a property interest. I mean, you can get a financing based on it. You can get a mortgage on it. You can, in some cases, uh, uh, sec, you know, use it as security, blah, 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 right? The fact that it's time-limited, as are many property interests, doesn't make it less property. Well, I'm, so I'm not sure that's right because it happens against a baseline of permanent ownership somewhere, right? It, I, I think that, I, I, I mean, I think the answer is, right, uh, we, our, our assumption is somebody actually owns this. You have a le you lease, which is a sort of transfer of part of the right that I have given you. Yeah, but, you know, what you're saying is ultimately in the background there has to be fee simple absolute or it's not property, which becomes then basically an argument about a category. Adam says, no, you're wrong. As to the lessee, it's a property interest, and he doesn't care if it comes out of the blue sure. and goes away after his 20 years. He doesn't care or she. It's a property right, and that, and I have all the attributes. So it, it may be an example of sort of proving Adam's point, which is if your mental construct is fee simple absolute or nothing, then you're not really arguing against property. You're arguing that patents are not fee simple absolute. And hey, OK, I don't think Adam will quibble. <laughs> but all the non possessory interests, all the chattel, all the time limited interests sort of support his view that, hey, property is bigger than the box you want to stuff it into, so yeah. why can't IP fit in there, too? So, it's so a big box. as always, there are boundary uh, questions, right? Uh, and it's, it's absolutely right to say, you know, uh, there are similarities in certain respects between patents and certain types of property. Uh, there are also similarities between an employment contract for a year, right, and, uh, uh, and a, a lease uh, for a year of a, of a chattel. Uh, and yet we say, well, no, an employment contract is not a property interest. Uh, maybe Adam would disagree if he thinks a due process, if you, think, if you think civil rights are in fact property interests, maybe the conception is sufficiently capacious that it incorporates uh, various of these other things. And then, then I think we're into a definitional dispute. But I guess for me, the critical point is that both the actual economic realities on the ground of the way the patent system works and the way we designed the patent system in the statute right, reflect a kind of balancing of interests and judgment about what the government should and shouldn't grant to people that seems pretty different than, than most of the categories of things we call property. OK, fair enough. I'm going to give Adam some rebuttal time here, and then Mark, and then we can open it up. I'm sure you guys are generating some good questions out there. So Adam, go. Um, you don't even have to go to the more limited estate interest, right, to show that there's limits on property interests throughout, throughout the system, even on fee simple. You all learned adverse possession. That's a limit on a fee simple. If you are not engaging in a proper, dare I say, productive labor relationship with the object of your property in, of claim, and someone else does, then that shifts the presumption and the legitimate claim, the inchoate claim that the government perfects under certain evidentiary and, and temporal conditions, to then course a transfer from one person who claimed to be a property owner to another. It cuts short the fee simple outright in one person and goes to another. Rule against perpetuity. That's a limit on the creation of, uh, by fee simple, interest, uh, fee simple owners of how they can create additional limited property interests and future interests in their interest. There's tons of limits even on fee simples. Um, and that's because, and again, this relates to the point that the, the, the starting point is you've got, you've got an asset that someone has created or has claiming an interest in that they, an, of exclusive use. You define the scope of that exclusive use by the nature of the asset. So there's limits on water rights, which are pro fully protected property rights that are very different from the, uh, uh, from the limits on land and have, but provide similar protections as land and chattels and other types. And the same issues with air and the same issues with, with chattels, with foxes, and things of that sort, where the nature of the exclusive use that is secured to the person who's claiming the property interest is defined by the nature of the subject matter that is being secured. And so when, so when Mark says, well, do you have all these differences? My response is, no duh, of course there's differences. For the same reason we have differences between the protections for chat for foxes versus the protections for land versus the protections for water versus the protections for air rights. Um, so again, and, and just to come back to the, the, the point that quickly that Mark made about uh, um, uh, about boundary disputes in, in land, again, th this, this, this shows my point that uh, he's using an unduly narrow reductionist conception of what is property in land. Right? He's defining the boundary of land, or the pro excuse me, the boundary of property, or boundary of a fee simple, by land, by trespass. But you guys all learned in your first year property class that the boundaries of a fee simple are not defined by, uh, by fences. 
The estate is not the same thing as the land. The boundary of the estate is defined by all of the rights that define that estate, whether such as future interests, and this is why there's waste doctrine between possessory interest and future interest holder, nuisance doctrine, which is competing exclusive uses between different property owners, um, adverse possession claimants, easements claimants, and other types of, of rights that define the boundary dispute. So if you're going to be talking about boundary disputes in fee simple, you can't just use trespass as your comparison or your metric for comparing it to patents. You have to compare what are all of the boundary disputes in land, all of those cases you guys read about. And by the way, cases involving sort of disputes over wills. In fact, there's a very interesting um, um, analog between disputes over wills and patents. They, they both focus on the document. It's all about the words of the document used. And it's very linguistic. It's very formalistic. And, it's you, and there's no discussion, actually, about the actual subject matter. It's very much about what is, what's the nature of the document that's created this, this, this property interest. This is all, these are issues I talk about in my trespass fallacy paper, where I call out Besson and Moyer specifically for committing this fallacy, both on conceptual grounds and improperly comparing a full property right in patents to a limited doctrine in, in, in fee simple trespass, and on the empirical basis that we don't have actual empirical information on the full scope of boundary disputes when it comes to land. OK, Mark. Yep. So let me just uh, step back a bit and, and think a little bit about what's at stake in this debate. Right? Maybe the answer is it's just terminology. Uh, if your definition of property is sufficiently capacious to include a bunch of things that are unlike each other, uh, but which we can sort of throw in one category, even though legally we treat them different, uh, if you get that definition sufficiently broadly, you can definitely say uh, patents are property. You could say various other things are property. I think you could say employment contracts are property. Uh, wills, uh, while well, we treat in the real property class because they often involve conveyance of property, I think of, if anything, as contracts rather than, than property rights. But, um, but, the, but the critical difference, it seems to me, it has to do with what conclusions we draw and how we think about the legal rights the government grants. Right? So we heard a, a buried in his sort of initial uh, discussion, right? Adam made reference to a kind of moral right uh, to, to patents. Right? If you think of this as property, the natural inclination is to say, ah, somebody, the value creator, Adam says, right, is entitled to, has a legal, uh, uh, maybe a constitutional or pre-legal right, uh, a moral right, to own this thing. Um, and then our thinking about it tends to stop because we accept various categories of property that have been around for several hundred years. Uh, we accept that you have a right to land because your great grandparents had right to land. You know, maybe we shouldn't accept that uh, in this society, but we do. Um, we accept that you have a right to a physical thing because you made the thing or because you bought the thing. Uh, and we don't interrogate sort of why that is. And you know, I'm OK with that in real property, right? And I'm OK with that in personal property. But I think it's a bridge too far to say um, we should just accept uh, that, you know what? Whenever somebody comes up with an idea, the government will step in and prevent anyone else from using that idea or coming up with it on their own or coming up with an idea that's somewhat like it uh, for some period of time. That isn't to say that we shouldn't have patent rights. I actually think patent rights are a good idea. But thinking about them as they are, as government interferences with the marketplace, right, as regulation, makes us interrogate the question, why do we have this rule? Is the rule too broad or too narrow? Uh, and do we want it? Government regulation isn't a bad thing, though. It say that in front of the Federalist Society, so I might get, uh, I might just <laughs> lost my debater's points here. You like some government regulation. I promise you, you do. Um, right? If you ever get on an airplane, you are happy that there is government regulation. If you eat food that you did not grow yourself, you are happy that there is government regulation. But thinking about IP as government regulation causes us, I think, reasonably to step back and say, not, ooh, it's regulation, it's bad, we should never do it. But it's regulation. It's an interference with the way the market would work in the absence of this government bureaucracy. And we ought to question whether or not it's appropriate and exactly how broad, how big we want that regulation to be. Thanks. OK. So uh, the next step here is for uh, us, us to take questions from the audience. So I hope that uh, I'll see a line forming. If I don't, well, OK, good. <laughs> you see Robert anyway. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 
probably speak into the microphone if we're doing that. You want to? I mean, I have a, I have a thought on it, but okay. Well, you, you, you go first. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, so I, I think the answer is if you think of this as government regulation, then you should ask the question: Is this the kind of thing we want to grant a patent for? Uh, now, I am a personal believer in broad subject matter eligibility, uh, but I think that Congress has the power to say, you know what, certain things ought not be uh, patent eligible. Uh, surgical processes, as they said in 1996, don't belong within the scope of the patent system. If you think of it as a moral right, as an entitlement to own something because I invented it, you probably ought to think that that law is constitutionally problematic. That if I'm withdrawing from somebody their moral entitlement to patent something, I've done something that, uh, that the law should worry about. Um, so I, so I, you know, I think the answer is you've got greater latitude in Congress to restrict patentable subject matter as to restrict other things if you think of this as regulation than if you think of this as a pre-existing property right. That said, I don't in general think that limiting patentable subject matter is a good idea. Um, I think this is probably one place where in, in, in kind of practical result, Mark and I probably come out in the same place, I think, um, but we, we have very different approaches and frameworks for it. Um, I think if you think of it from a property perspective, um, then what you are focused upon is is this is this a new value creation that has of a useful of a useful art of some type of, of, of technology broadly defined that it can be secured to someone in the same way that we have secured the exclusive use of other types of assets. And if the answer is yes to that, then then that creates the presumption under that it's new and useful and meets the other requirements of the, of, of the statute that it should be secured in the, as a patent. So very a very broad. Uh, favorable approach to subject matter, which, by the way, historically is exactly the approach that the courts have taken. Um, as technology has evolved, uh, you know, and as the ways that people have invented things have co uh, come into existence that have been entirely new, they have been brought by the courts within the scope of the patent protection. And I think that's because of the underlying property framework. Um, I, d I disagree with, uh, with, with Mark, though, that, um, that you know, if you are saying to someone that you have to meet certain conditions, um, in order to uh, in order to have a property claim in it, that that makes it constitutionally problematic, or that suggests that this is not property. If that's the case, then title recordation statutes are unconstitutional. Adverse possession statutes are unconstitutional. Um, you know, the decision in the decision in in, um, in in Pearson v. Post, where both labored to get the fox, uh, is 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 unconstitutional. It's it's um it's 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 a very it's a very facile facile way of thinking about the idea of productive labor as the basis of property claims. To think therefore productive labor means property. End of story. End of thinking. I understand that some lay people think like that, but that doesn't. But that's not how the courts have thought, and that's not how and that's not how the the, 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 the we've thought about it from the patent system or in any property system historically or up through today. <laughs> <laughs> I've been called worse than that. <laughs> Go ahead, you're next. No, I, I think that's a that's a great a, a great question. Um, I've I've thought about that. Um, some, the um, the issue again. This goes to the the independent invention challenges. I think the perspective of property that means if labor if value creation ergo must have property. Um, uh, the fact that the law doesn't respect that challenges that that presumption. Now, there's two ways you can think from that perspective. The law is wrong, or maybe there's something wrong in the way you're framing the initial presumption. 
And I think there's a problem with the initial framing of the presumptions. The, uh, and, and again, it goes back to Pearson v. Post, right? They bo the, both of those people went into court with the claim, we productively labored. I was hunting the fox. I, I crack captured the fox. They both had the legitimate claim to productive labor. But what it goes, to, but but the important point to show is that in that case, the, ultimately the court had to recognize that yes, labor is a justification for uh, for property. But there are other justifications for property, especially situating property within a broader framework of equal protection of all rights and the capa capability of institutions to protect those rights. So we have evidentiary concerns, evidentiary burdens that which are built into 102, which I think reflect the property presumption there. Um, and other issues, which is why the court ultimately said, for, for issues of certainty and better securing property right claimants, we are going to go with the person who actually has their hands on the fox as opposed to necessarily the person who is chasing the fox. Because in, uh, because in those, both of those cases, the labor is, is, is equal. Now, you don't, so what this means is you don't necessarily have to have an independent intervention defense, or you should have an independent intervention defense. Copyright, they don't. Right? They don't, independent invention is a complete defense to a copyright infr in, uh, infringement claim. Um, but what you see is that the legal systems have been, have been structured differently such that they accommodate these, 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 these narrowing of the scope of protection. So for instance, in copyright, independent creation is an absolute defense. Copyright provides more expansive protections in other areas, longer term protections. Whereas in patents, you don't have an independent invention defense, but you have a shorter term. So you have more robust protection for a shorter period of time. And so what you see is, is, that, the, the, is that in application through, I think what uh, Rob has talked about, is intermediate principles where you deploy broader principles through particular doctrines, that the particular doctrines end up reflecting a careful balancing of different claims, for instance, like the right of claim of labor, the right of claim of equal protection between different people's labors, and the ways that institutions can ultimately enforce that in society through like evidentiary concerns, for instance. There, there was only one fox in Pearson versus Post. Right? The court had to say, this person A gets the fox or person B gets the fox. IP is fundamentally different than that right? because it is uh, non-excludable, because it's non-rivalrous. Uh, so an equivalent for patent law would be to say, because you caught the fox, uh, the other guy not only uh, uh, is not entitled to your fox, he's not entitled to hunt foxes on his own property himself. Because you have the exclusive right not to this fox, but to the concept of possession of a fox. That's a fundamentally different thing, and I think it's a fundamentally different thing that follows from the fundamental differences in the economics of uh, intellectual creation uh, from physical things. Right? Um, now, we could say, I want to apply the same legal rules, uh, but I think you then run quickly into circumstances right, in which applying the same legal rules doesn't get you very far. If what I want is not to hold on to my fox, but to prevent you from hunting, hunting foxes yourself, uh, I need something very different than what traditional property law gives me. What I need is the government to step in and say, OK, notwithstanding the market, notwithstanding private property, your own land and your own productive labor, uh, we are going to limit what you can do. And that's what patents do. OK, next question. Uh, I think there's a spectrum between property rights and contracts or other non-property rights. And some things are more like property and others might be necessarily property like things. Right, the non-transferable rights you say by creditor being much less property rights. Uh, how, what do you think the most important factors, or maybe you think there's a bright line between what property and non-property is? And do, do you agree or disagree that it's something like that? Well, that's it. That's, I mean, that's a great question because I mean, Mark keeps saying that I, I think that everything's property, and I and I don't. I mean, there there are very. I mean, to say that you know, property or patents are civil rights securing property rights similar to other civil rights. There are, what I'm saying is that there are a broad category of civil rights, due process rights, rights to jury, rights to, uh, right, right to recordation, conveyance rights, contract rights, um, that patents are part of. So it's not, not, not saying that property is the baseline, but that in this con in, from this perspective, civil rights is a broader category. But to get to your, to your question, as an historical matter, as you, as you, as you all know, from your from your one L classes, right? It, at common law, there were no distinctions. I mean, the, the, these are conceptual categories that we've created. At common law, you just had the writs, uh, you had, and 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 it was only in the 19th century, thanks to Christopher Columbus Langdell and Justice uh, Holm, that they actually looked back over the common law and they said, well, some writs are very much are like involve transactions between people, voluntary transactions, and we're going to call that contract. 
And some, and some of these, and some writs are, very, are, are about involuntary transactions between people, and we're going to call that torts. And some involve the use of some type of valued asset designated in the world. And we're going to call that and classify that as property. So you're right, these are conceptual categories, but I do see these conceptual categories as distinct from each other, even, but they're very much interplaying with each other as well. Um, but when you're talking about property, to go back to my original, my opening remarks, you're talking about securing to someone a domain of exclusive use and disposal <coughs> of that asset, right? And so of an asset, of, of some type of designated value in the world, whether it's a new invention, because frankly, you know, I said, oh yeah, there's different, there's lots of different, there's only one fox. Well, there's only, you know, per our original novelty rules, there's only one person who can claim the original novelty. And, and so, yes, you can have multiple people create it, but one person, but there's the person who gets it first. And that's the person who gets the, got the original claim to it. And that's, a, that's an identifiable uh, uh, um, baseline, just as they had the identifiable baseline of there's just this one fox. So, I, but the fox or the first invention become the subject matter, which then the person gets the exclusive right to determine how this thing will be used. So I, I think Adam, it's absolutely right that there is a spectrum. And I think both Adam and I uh, are, are going to agree that there's a spectrum and that some things are closer and more uh, like platonic property than others. Um, Adam made a, a useful uh, a statement, right? Sort of, you know, we put these things in categories. Voluntary transactions, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, we'll throw them in the contract label. Uh, transactions or, or in encounters between people involuntarily, we'll throw in the tort label. And something else we'll throw in the property label. I guess the point I want you to take away is in patent law today, and I'm not sure this was true 100 or 200 years ago, but it is absolutely true today, the modal interaction is not um, I come to use your land and I want to use your land, or I come to use your uh, lease or legal uh, uh, servitude or other right and I want to use your right. The modal transaction in patent law today is between strangers. Right? It is between people who are minding their own business until one of them pops up with a patent right and says, you must stop what you were doing independently because you've run into my interests. That sounds like a tort right to me. Right? Uh, we could call uh, all traffic accidents property cases because you've trespassed on my personal property. You dented my car. Uh, we don't. Is the distinction artificial? Yeah, in some sense, there's a, there's a sort of line to conceptually to be drawn. But if you're going to draw those lines, this is on the tort side, not the property side. Okay, let, I, let me just say two things about it. I've been holding my fire here. <laughs> um, that, that Mark makes a good point. I, I, there, there's a very nice literature on essentially generating a lot of IP conceptually from tort-like foundations, for example, restitution. I mean, Wendy Gordon's done some fantastic work on that. Having said that, you know, one of the standard definitions of property that you get in your first year course is a right good against the world. Well, if that doesn't apply to strangers, then what's a property right? I don't understand. Uh, you don't have to know a trespasser in order to bring a cause of action. So anyway, that's one. Second point uh, goes to the regulatory issue. And you know, Mark used the funny example of the, of the Texan defending his or her uh, property. And we wouldn't want to extend that, uh, that, that, that riff to IP. We probably don't want to extend it very far at all. Uh, likewise, you could say, okay, what do we think of as our canonical regulatory regimes? FDA approval, um, EPA regulation or approval, things like that. We don't generally want, you know, a company to be able to sell its FDA approval to another company because it's very site specific. It means that your manufacturing is very safe and you know what you're doing in making these pills. You can't just sell that to any third party. So the, one of the critical earmarks there is non-alienability. Regulation is site-specific and it's company-specific. Well, that's very different from IP because IP is, is inherently and, and, and uh, you know, actually highly transferable. You know, it changes hands all the time, starting at birth with patents when, you, when the inventor assigns to the employer typically, but then multiple transactions in many cases down the road. So if, if patents are a regulatory instrument, then why are they so freely transferable, which is fundamentally different from most regulatory regimes? Not all. Now, I, I admit, there's a big movement these days in ad law and in, regu in, in the regulatory world to, to try to make regulatory approvals subject to market transactions, cap and trade, and all that. But what do they call that? They call that propertizing regulation. They call, they call it, let's make regulation look more like property, which in some sense 
tends to, to, to weigh on so that. I'm not, so I, I want to challenge the premise of the argument, right? I, I, it's not clear to me that it's right to say that if I got a permit uh, to pollute in a particular spot uh, or uh, an FDA approval to sell a drug, that the fact that I sell my company to someone else right, means we start over. I, quite the contrary, right? The government might have some interest in making sure that the same thing you did a year ago is the same thing that's done in the future, but I think we trade regulatory permits all the time, and I'm not sure we could actually survive as a society if we didn't. Well, they have to um, run with underlying assets, whereas IP doesn't. You don't have to sell your factory and machinery. You can sell the patent I, as a freestanding I, right. That's I, I, yeah, I, should, I should note, by the way, uh, we have uh, <laughs> mostly by agreement uh, uh, kept to patents in our discussion of IP. There are a variety of IP regimes, and for some, the statement Rob just made is false. You can't actually sell your trademark independent right. of the underlying assets or at least the goodwill so for precisely best, right. this regulatory. That's your best, that's your best uh, example of a regulatory, quote, right, would be a trademark. And, and, and for that reason, I mean, in any, in any conceptual classification scheme, right, you're going to have right. some, uh, some uh, uh, elements that fall closer to the boundary between those two types of things. And I think trademarks and rights of publicity and other types of IP rights fall closer to those boundaries. Yeah. But you get more close to, cor uh, to the center with patents and copyrights than in the classic uh, right. I think I, I think I would agree with everything except that I think they're further from the boundaries on the other <laughs> side. <laughs> Kevin, do you have a question, or are you? Are you cutting to... us off? No. no <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh well. Thanks for standing, though. Uh, uh, thank you, Kevin. And I think uh, that, that, that's a really great question because that goes exactly to the issue of the importance of foundation. Um, how, how you start from your founding premise of what you think is the fundamental point to make about IP or make about property or make about anything really defines in very much uh, uh, significant ways how you end up defining the actual application of, of the thing you're talking about. Um, and so there are two different ways that you can say are the most fundamental premise to start with when you're talking about securing in, uh, the exclusive use of an asset. You can say we start from the premise that it has to be, you know, there's, there's things that are scarce in the world. This is, the, this is what economic analysis starts with. You, things are scarce in the world, and people have conflicts over scarcity, so we have to mediate those conflicts over scarcity. So when things aren't scarce, things are non-rivalrous and non-excludable, then that changes the, di the, the, the dynamic and puts you in a different category. That, and it, and that's, a, that's an economic starting po um, uh, point for, the, for in the dominant framework today for understanding IP. I start from a different foundation. Because my, when people say there are things that are in the world that are scarce, my first response is, well, where do those things come from? Because you don't go out into the forest and find air conditioners or houses or clothes or trees or smart, or, I mean, or smartphones. You find, you find the, the stuff of the world that people then take and turn into those important values that serve human life and human flourishing. And so for me, the economics starts by, by begging the question and that the real fundamental point is property is about securing to someone the value that they have created through their productive labor by creating that air conditioner or that, or that thing or coming up with the new technology. And for instance, I think this is what locks great insight in the Second Treatise, which is why it has remained so powerful for so long. Um, very often people think that Locke was talking about farming, but all of Locke's examples in the Second Treatise are examples of technology. He talks about plowing. Um, he talks about bread baking, shipbuilding, tools. All of his examples in, um, in the Second Treatise are examples of useful arts. And in fact, at the very end of Chapter 5 on property in, in the Second Treatise, Locke refers to arts and inventions as exemplars of his labor theory. Um, he was very aware of this, that it's value creation which is the basis of property. Now, when you then talk about how do you secure this, prop this value to this person appropriately, questions like what's the nature of the value that's been created come into play. This is what I was referring to earlier. The subject matter of the asset defines the nature of the creation, of 
of, of the, the, so it defines the nature of the legal securing of that as a, as, as a property interest. So for instance, water, which is, by the way, non-rivalous and non-exclusive, but nonetheless is a property right, is protected in very different ways than property rights in land, which is protected in very different ways than property rights in chattels, which is protected in very different ways than property rights in air, which are nonetheless non-exclusive and non-rivalrous. These are all property rights, um, but they're property rights because of the value creation that it can occur in the air through, this, through spectrum rights or other types of, of, of creation of those rights in building skyscrapers, or the value creation in water through building mills or fishing and things of that sort that therefore they to take into account the non-exclusive and non-rivalous aspect to define the, the nature of the legal protections. But, and this goes to term limits and patents and copyrights. But that doesn't mean under, under, under lease that it's not a property right. Let, let, me make, let me make a quick sociological point before we take maybe one more question. Oh, no, is, I think he's coming to cut us off. He's coming uh, to cut okay, us okay, off. Can I? Mark, we should end the mark. <laughs> Well, so I mean, I guess uh, it, so. Adam is certainly right to say, uh, you know, there are uh, there are these different characteristics, and we should take them account in, into account in different ways. Um, I, I want to go back to where I started and the East India Trading Company. Right? Um, if you define a set of legal entitlements uh, that is sufficiently narrow that they allow people to act on their particular property and to interact and trade it with others, you end up with a market economy. If you define a set of legal entitlements so broad that it controls what other people can do uh, with their property and their invention and their value creation, uh, then you end up, I think, not with a market economy, uh, but a sclerotic economy, right? a mercantilist economy of the kind that uh, the British government thought it was doing something useful by vesting exclusive rights in the East India Trading Company. It was giving them incentives to go out and trade with India. Uh, but I think in the modern world, our assessment is um, we ought to be careful uh, about the scope and the breadth of the control we give people over what other people can do with their ideas, their value, and their property. And we're going to exercise that care only if we don't instinctively think this is a property right and therefore a moral right. Here's my version of this, and then you can go. I say, you know, one person's incentive is another person's rent. That's what I'm <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. The